American actor Robert Wagner once said, a dog will teach you unconditional love. If you have that in your life, things won't be too bad. It's a truth universally accepted. And something that Emily will learn after meeting her soulmate in Garth, an irresistible Labrador service dog. Garth is as innocent and playful as every puppy born into this world. At eight weeks old, he's already curious about the world around him. He looks up expectantly at Mark, a trainer for the Visionary Guide Dog Foundation, and follows him around. Mark is currently looking for a puppy to be trained by a volunteer raiser for two years, before officially handing it over to a client in need. He sees Garth and baptizes him with that name. Mark knows that Garth will be an excellent guide dog when he grows up. But in Garth's puppy mind, he doesn't know what it means. As a tradition, and to formally welcome the puppy into the world of guide dogs, he brings Garth to a coffee shop and treats him with a pup cake. It's a peanut butter flavor, which is totally safe and tasty for Garth. One of the patrons accidentally drops a piece of chocolate cake. Garth would have gobbled it up, had it not been for the quick intervention of the patron, who turns out to be Emily. That's the first time Garth sees her and falls for her, but it'll be the last time she'll see Garth. Emily is a go-getter who is passionate about rock climbing. In fact, the day she came to that coffee shop and met the cute puppy was the day she introduced her fiancé, Connor, to her hobby. They have just come from a nearby gym called Crag X owned by Emily's good friend, Matthew. She's happy that the man she'll tie the knot with soon is appreciative of the things she loves. She kisses him, unaware of the look that her friend Matthew sends them. When she's not exercising or practicing rock climbing, Emily is an excellent team leader in the corporate world. Her members adore her, with her signature box of muffins for everyone, and her fair treatment for each of them. One Friday during her meeting with the team, she reminds them that she'll be out by lunch, because she has scheduled a vacation with her fiancé. Drew, one of the members, offers to work on their technical-related tasks over the weekend. But Emily sternly tells him no one should work on a weekend. It's meant to be spent on more important things. Drew is a bit surprised, because he's used to being overworked by his manager. But it's not Emily's style as a team leader. After a productive day at work, Emily walks out with Connor and tells him about the bet everyone made about them. They think it will be him who will pick up the phone first, but some think it will be Emily. The couple are both hardworking and goal-oriented, and they're both good-natured about the teasing. What's important is they get to spend some time with each other and talk about their upcoming wedding. Emily and Connor go kayaking on calm waters. They amiably discuss some details of their wedding, and Emily scratches off an item on her list. She's big on listing down things. After rowing for some time, they arrive at a rocky island. According to Emily's map, they can go around the rock outcrop and walk to their destination for 30 minutes and call it a day, or go right through it. Connor decides to test his climbing skills to impress his fiance. Although a bit uncertain, Emily can see that he's enthusiastic about the climb. She is about to follow him when he accidentally steps on a group of loose rocks. The rocks fall on Emily, causing her to fall back and hit her head on the ground. When she wakes up, everything looks dark. It takes her a minute to realize her eyes are covered in bandages. She senses her mom, Martha, beside her, and she calls for Connor, who immediately sits on her other side. He's quite uncertain how to tell Emily what happened. He reminds her that they went for a hike when an accident happened, and she hit her head on the rocks. Before Connor can continue, Dr. Anderson comes in and greets her patient. Emily asks why her eyes are in bandages, and if she can take them off. Dr. Anderson patiently explains that it may take two to three weeks before that can happen, and that is if everything works out well. She adds that Emily's fall caused post-traumatic iridocyclitis, and they had to operate on her eyes. It could be healed in a couple of weeks, but long-term complications may arise, including permanent vision loss. The doctor can't give Emily any promises of healing. Instead, she strongly recommends round-the-clock care and sitting still. Emily is in distress. She doesn't do well with sitting still. Days after, she comes home to Connor's house, with her mother guiding her and bringing her things. It's a new pitch black world for her, literally. But she doesn't let this darken her optimism. She calls for Martha and Connor. She holds their hands and tells them it's going to be a tough couple of weeks. She believes she'll figure it out, and everything's going to be fine. However, she might as well admit she's only convincing herself with optimism. Soon, Emily finds out how hard her disability will make her dependent on others. Connor has arranged a work-from-home setup, but he still needs to go out from time to time, leaving Emily alone in the house. She tries to fight off the bubbling despair inside her ever since she woke up from the hospital by doing simple and normal things. She walks around the house, bumping her way into chairs and tables. She attempts to charge her phone on the counter, before realizing she's picked up the wrong charger. She gropes for snacks, hoping for the best that she picks up the right thing. Just as she's satisfied with her little effort and shuffling back to the sofa, she trips on her overnight bag. She falls on the sofa and spills her snacks, which turn out to be pasta. When Connor comes home, he sees Martha sweeping the spilled pasta off the carpet. They have a whispered argument about Emily's situation. Martha wants her daughter to be assisted, and for everything to be arranged for her needs. Connor simply can't fulfill everything due to his demanding work. 
Emily calls them out by saying she would appreciate it if she's included in the conversation, rather than have them talk about her in whispers. With a heavy sigh, Martha makes a decision that she knows will be heavy on her daughter. She says it'll be better for everyone if Emily stays with her at the family house. There, she can look out for her and customize things for her needs. Reluctantly Connor agrees, adding that it may not be the worst decision, but it's in Emily's best interest. Eventually, Martha brings her daughter home. She sets her on the back porch of the house to let her feel the soft breeze. Alone, it finally dawns on Emily that she's lost one vital part of her character, her independence. For someone who's confident and always does things on their own, it's hard to come to terms with sudden reliance on anyone. Meanwhile, Garth is starting his training as a guide dog. Mark gives the puppy to Katie, a volunteer puppy raiser. Mark orients Katie and her son about the do's and don'ts of the training. He emphasizes that the main goals are basic training and socialization for Garth. Then, he proposes to take their day one picture. Before leaving, Mark reminds Katie that Garth is exceptionally food motivated. Indeed, the puppy is already devouring the peanut butter sandwich left by the sun. Katie is flustered, but soon she gets used to it. The first things that Garth learns are where his bed is, and where his toys are. In his puppy mind, Garth doesn't like the idea of sitting for a long time, but the treats he gets for doing so compensate for it. Katie also teaches the puppy to fetch, although it seems like Garth will take a long time to truly learn it. To her credit, Katie is patient and puts a lot of effort into it. Plus, she can't help but fall for Garth's cuteness. One day, Mark visits Katie to check on her progress. She only laughs as she holds a sleeping Garth in her arms. Speaking of visits, Drew decides to visit Connor's house to inquire about Emily. It turns out it's been three weeks since Emily's accident, and she asked Connor not to tell anyone about it due to embarrassment. Even her good friend Matthew doesn't know about her situation. When Connor keeps quiet about his fiancé's condition, Drew suddenly gets wild ideas about mystery files and unsolved cases. Connor is amused, but he finally tells Drew what really happened. Now knowing about his team leader's condition, Drew decides to pay Emily a visit. On her mother's back porch, Emily sits comfortably on a sofa when she senses someone near her. Zoe, a teenager from a neighboring house, stands near her holding a Tupperware of soup that she's supposed to give to Martha. Curious about Emily's condition, she decides to sit on a chair beside Emily. The two have a friendly discussion, before Zoe suggests that Emily should get a guide dog. However the latter firmly believes that her condition is temporary. There's no need to get a dog. After this conversation, Drew arrives bringing junk food. He helps Emily set up the voice assistant on her phone. This definitely helps her in doing her usual lighter tasks. He offers to inform the team about her situation, but Emily declines. She says she doesn't want anyone to worry about her or make a fuss. It doesn't feel good for her. But Drew makes a point about people getting concerned for not knowing anything about her situation. Emily realizes it must have affected her team's morale, so she allows him to inform them about her. Days pass. Connor visits Emily in her mother's house, and they share a sweet moment by the back porch. Out of the blue, he invites her to eat out. She's hesitant, but he promises to protect her from any onlookers who will ogle her. They end up in a restaurant called The Mariner. It's a busy establishment by the port, and Emily is filled with the buzz of cutleries and conversations. Without her vision, it's easy to feel that heavy feeling of scrutiny, especially with people's loud laughs and excited whispers, even if they're not about her. Lindy, their server, does an excellent job of making her comfortable by pointing out where her cutleries are. Emily asks if she can wash her hands. Lindy offers to guide her to the restroom, but Connor takes it from there. He leads her to the restroom and waits outside. When he receives a phone call, he has no choice but to go outside due to the restaurant's noise. Inside, Emily is clearly not used to groping around. She's frustrated realizing that a menial task, almost an automatic action such as washing one's hands, becomes a major event when one's vision is lost and not used to it. She comes out of the restroom and calls for Connor, but he's not there. She decides to come back to their table alone, trying to prove to herself that she can do it on her own. But she bumps into people and servers, making it hard to do. Thankfully, Lindy sees her and offers to guide her back to her table. Just in time, Connor comes back. Emily decides to take out their orders. She can't stand the feeling of everyone looking at her and laughing at her dependence. Zoe visits Emily again and airs her concerns about choosing school clubs. She mentions another girl inviting her to join their rock climbing club, and they're supposed to go to a nearby gym called Crag X for practice. Emily is excited to hear about the familiar gym, since she used to go there, and she remembers her good friend Matthew. But Zoe expresses her concerns. She may end up like Emily if she's not careful. Emily understands the teenager's concern. She assures her that what happened was a total accident. Nobody had known that she had a pre-existing condition until then. She could have had any other accident and still lost her vision. She encourages Zoe to give rock climbing a try. Their conversation ends when Connor arrives. He seems tense upon seeing his fiance. Emily takes this chance to express her assurance that Connor is not to blame for what happened to her. Her conversation with Zoe has made her realize that she should have told him earlier, and she's sorry that she didn't. He feels relieved and appreciative to hear that. Now, it's time for him to tell her something. 
he's finally gotten the promotion he's been waiting for. Emily is happy for him. But the catch is, he must take over the company's Tokyo office. She says she can't go to Tokyo, because she hasn't recovered, and she can't just leave her job. It dawns on her that he has already accepted the offer without consulting her. She forces him to say something, since she can't see his expression. He mutters that he can't say no. With that, she orders him to leave. The next day, Emily and Martha go to the hospital to have her routine checkup. They pass by a woman and her dog along the hallway. Even though Emily can't sense the dog, Garth definitely remembers her. He's bigger than before, but still a pup. He remembers Emily's good scent, but there's something new about her to his senses. To Garth, Emily smells scared. It's not only Emily that's going through tough challenges. Garth has similar issues, too, specifically with his focus. The dog easily gets distracted by noises, and most of all with food. Whenever he hears Katie open a packet of chips, he immediately runs to her for a bite. Katie is also worried that Garth hasn't completed his vaccinations yet because of this. In addition, the dog seems to have separation anxiety as well. One time, she comes home to see her pillows and stuffed toys all ruined, and Garth excitedly running toward her. When Mark visits her, he assures her that everything is fine and normal with Garth, and that she's raising the dog well. He picks up a toy and gives it to Garth. Then in a serious tone, Mark tells him that he needs to learn how to carry things, because as a guide dog, he will be helping visually impaired people. It seems like this gets through to Garth's puppy mind. Everything he's been doing is his training to become the eyes for someone with visual disabilities. He remembers Emily, and he finally understands that he needs to work hard so he can be with her. Garth may be optimistic, as in the ways of lovable retrievers, which is in contrast with Emily's situation. From that hospital visit, she finds out that her disability is permanent. Adding this to her recent breakup with Connor, she begins to feel invalid. She feels like she's lost her sense of this world, her identity. Her main characteristic, her way of life, independence, is now taken away from her. Her usual outgoing countenance is replaced by low mood when Zoe visits her. Even when Drew comes to help her set her work table, she's not in the best mood and snaps at him. Drew reminds her what she always tells the team, work with what they know. Emily knows that she's permanently blind, so to work is to accept the fact that help is unavoidable. Well, Emily says, there's one thing Drew can help her with. That is, to submit her resignation letter to HR. Drew is taken aback that his team leader seems to have lost all hope. Meanwhile, Zoe takes Emily's advice to give rock climbing a try. She's in Crag X when she remembers that the owner is Emily's friend. So she approaches Matthew and tells him about Emily. He visits her, finding her lounging on the couch on the back porch. Emily is pleasantly surprised to know Matthew's there. But when he offers to walk with her, she refuses, saying she's uncomfortable doing anything. He convinces her that that's not who she is, and she can't spend the rest of her life sitting there. Emily finally stands up, puts her hand on his arm, and lets him guide her along the beach. She updates him on what has happened, including her breakup with Connor. When she asks him about his life lately, Matthew admits he's been calling her. When he got no answers, he thought she might be mad at him or something. He asks her to promise never to vanish again like that. Emily gives her word, and hugs him as an apology. When they get back to the porch, Matthew abruptly leaves her. It turns out Emily's team, led by Drew, is there to visit her. Drew says no one on their team wants to pass her resignation letter to HR. They unanimously voted it should be Emily who must do so. In addition, they don't want her to resign, so they suggested that she enroll at the nearby school for the blind. At first, Emily doesn't want to. It would be akin to accepting her condition, which she still finds hard to do. But she remembers Matthew's words. She's not someone who will just idly sit on a couch doing nothing. She realizes it's true, and she can't let her condition stop her from living her best life. With a determined sigh, she calls Matthew to accompany her to the nearby school for the blind. There, they are given a tour by Julie. She emphasizes two things, orientation and mobility, which will be taught to Emily on her first days in the school. Emily is surprised to find out Julie is also a visually impaired person. Yet, her impression of her is a fully functioning person with no visual disabilities at all. Julie explains she lost her eyesight five years ago, but it didn't stop her from living a normal life. She has her own apartment, cooks, dates, and has even tried skiing. Emily can't help but feel emotional. Here is the hope she lost when she lost her sight. When she learns to embrace her condition, then she'll get to do the things she always did. Two months after enrolling in the school, Emily shows great progress. She's now using a cane. With Julie's supervision, she feels confident using it. And now, the time has come to walk on her own. Julie gives her the task to go back to the school's main building. With that, she leaves her alone. Emily repeatedly stutters that she can't, before realizing that she has to try. Watching her is a worried Matthew, who describes to Julie her progress. Emily continues to walk, relying on the taps of her cane on the ground. At one point, she almost walks onto the roadway. But she turns around and finds the pathway again. 
Then she stumbles onto a post. Matthew is ready to run to her, but Julie stops him. She points out that if he helps Emily at every setback, she'll never regain her independence. Matthew understands, although he still can't help but worry about her. Eventually, Emily reaches them. Her confidence boosted by her triumph in finding them, she asks Matthew if they can have lunch at the marina, because she feels she has unfinished business with the place. If you remember, it's where she first struggled using the restroom, and first felt belittled with her condition. It may seem petty for some, but for Emily, it's considered a win toward gaining her independence. In the restroom, she meets with Lindy again. Emily seems more confident than before, although she's still finding her ground. Lindy walks her back to her table with Matthew. She lets Emily know she approves of the upgrade she's made, and not just about the cane. As fate would have it, Katie and Garth are also there. Katie has decided it's time for Garth to face his biggest nemesis, a place full of food and nice smells. It's important for Garth to improve his focus and remain attentive to his handler. But Garth sees and smells Emily, and he gets excited to come to her. And when a lady comes in with her own support dog who runs towards Garth, the dog simply loses his focus. Unfortunately, this causes a small scene, which ends up with the lady getting evicted from the establishment. To Katie, this isn't considered successful training, but not totally a failure. Garth works hard because he hopes that one day, he can be Emily's guide dog. Eventually, Katie gives Garth a second chance. Before entering the restaurant, she reminds the dog that this training is important so he can become helpful to those who need him. Garth may not answer in human language, but his eyes say he understands the assignment. This time, the distraction comes in the form of a small toddler who wants to pet Garth. He loves pets, but he follows Katie's command to stand beside her. Throughout the whole time they're there, Garth keeps his focus on Katie. Garth is a good boy who works hard to be the best guide dog for Emily. Speaking of Emily, she decides to go back to her previous routine of buying muffins for her team before going to the office. But she scraps the idea after her disastrous first try, which includes getting left behind by her Uber ride, entering a stranger's car, and leaving her muffins there. In the end, she realizes it's best to take things slowly. So, with the help of Drew, she sets up her workstation at home and communicates with her team online. Drew has also developed an assistive app, which is an immense help for Emily's demanding work nature. Soon she'll get back to her previous routine, but for now, she may enjoy the process of getting there. One day, during her day off, Emily and Matthew watch a movie together while cozily lounging on the couch. Matthew patiently describes the scenes to her. She asks him to pause the movie. Throughout her journey of regaining her confidence and independence, Matthew has always been there every step of the way. She wants to know why he's exerting more than the expected effort. Matthew sighs, thinking this is now or never. He tells her she's his friend, and he loves her. Even though she can't see, Emily can sense that Matthew is referring to a love that's more than being friends. But she doesn't ask him to elaborate. Not yet. Instead she laughs, as she thinks this is indeed a new chapter in her life, even in love. She slowly puts her head on his shoulder, and he gently pulls her closer. Finally, Emily gives in to the signs. She's been getting a lot of hints about getting a dog, from Zoe, to Matthew, and even in the movies she's listening to. Together with Matthew, she visits the Visionary Guide Dog Foundation to inquire about guide dogs. Mark welcomes them. He introduces Olivia, who will be orienting Emily about them. Olivia is a sweet woman who has funny anecdotes about her dog Cody. She touches on the subject of getting into restrooms. She tells Emily that Cody has been a lot of help getting her to where she wants. Emily stops for a moment, thinking about her own experiences. It's not just getting into restrooms, but it's the little things that everybody takes for granted that really count the most. She accepts that getting a dog may just be the missing puzzle piece to complete her new life chapter. To lighten up the mood, Olivia says that half the time Cody leads her to the men's restroom, which is a real hoot. Days pass. It's finally time for Garth to say goodbye to Katie. As a first-time puppy raiser, she has done a good job training and socializing Garth. Even though it's a sad moment for her, she's proud that the dog will be a great help to his next handler. As a memento, Mark prepares something for her. He takes Garth's paw, presses it on an ink pad, and transfers his paw print onto the back of a large photo, which turns out to be the day one picture he took before. Katie is so grateful to have this. She's going to miss Garth very much. When they leave Mark's room, they don't notice Emily and Matthew sitting nearby. They are there to join the long list of people who will get a guide dog. They don't notice her, but Garth does. He runs towards her, licking her face in a joyful reunion. Garth thinks he's finally coming home to Emily, to be her guide dog. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Mark has to pull him away, explaining that Emily has to wait to get her own dog, and it may not be Garth who will be given to her. Emily understands, but she feels it's a shame to not have such a sweet dog as Garth. As for Garth, he doesn't want to go, but none of the humans seems to understand. Soon, Emily gets back her life the way it used to be. She feels happy, knowing that she has overcome her disability. But Matthew thinks she can do more. He visits her and gives her a present. It's a model of the rock climbing pattern based on one of the walls of his gym, and it's made from Lego. He encourages her to memorize the placements of the juts and holds, so she can climb the real one when she comes back. Emily is uncertain if she can go back to rock climbing. She says she's a different Emily now. 
Matthew agrees and says she's much stronger now. He leaves her to think about it. By next week, she surprises her team by reporting to the office and bringing them muffins. Everyone is elated to have her back. Team productivity will rise again under Emily's leadership. After work she receives a call from Mark, who tells her some surprising good news. Lately, Mark is getting concerned about Garth. He's being stubborn towards his new handler, and doesn't follow commands. He even ignores the sound of opening a bag of chips, which is his favorite. Mark doesn't know what to think about it. He reminds the dog that if nothing changes, he may be rahamed and considered a failure for being a guide dog. Garth remains sad. Then Mark gets an idea. He says Emily's name out loud. Instantly, the dog jumps up and becomes excited. Mark can't believe it, but he now knows the best course of action to take for both Emily and Garth. He visits Emily, and he can see that Garth immediately recognizes her. The dog is also easily following her commands. Mark comments that it looks like Garth has known Emily all his life. That is true, but only the dog knows it. Mark says he'll take care of the papers, but effectively, Garth is now Emily's guide dog. Emily is so happy with the way her life is going. She eventually comes back to Cragex to try and get back to rock climbing. As Matthew puts on her harness, she finally asks about what he said when they were watching a movie. Matthew clarifies that he's been in love with her since the first time he met her. Then he asks her if he's alone and feeling this. Emily turns to him, smiles, and answers he's not. With that, they share their first kiss as a couple. Then he turns her around and leads her to touch the first hold on the wall. With her perseverance, and with Matthew's love and Garth's support, she starts climbing. And in due time, she's back doing her favorite outdoor activity. Garth is simply happy to be with Emily. He has become her eyes, and she has become his world. 